In the last lesson, we began to define what computation is, with the goal of eventually being precise about what it can and cannot do. We said that the input to any computation can be expressed as a string, and we assumed that whatever the instructions there were for turning input into output, that these two could be expressed as a string. Using a counting argument, we were able to show that there were some functions that were not computable. In this lesson, we're going to look at how input gets turned into output more closely. Specifically, we're going to study the Turing machine, the classical model of computation. As we'll see in a later lesson, Turing machines can do everything that we consider as computation, and because of their simplicity, they are a terrific tool for studying computation and its limitations. Massively parallel machines, quantum computers, they can't do anything that a Turing machine can't do. Turing machines were never intended to be practical, but nevertheless, several have been built for illustrative purposes, including this one from Mike Davey. The input to the machine is a tape onto which the string input has been written. Using a read-write head, the machine turns input into output through a series of steps. At each step, a decision is made about whether and what to write to the tape and whether to move it to the right or to the left. This decision is based on exactly two things, the current symbol under the read-write head and something called the machine state, which also gets updated as the symbol is written. That's it. The machine stops when it reaches one of two halting states, named accept and reject. Usually, we're interested in which of these two states the machine halts in. Though, when we want to compute functions from strings to strings, then we pay attention to the tape contents instead. It's a very interesting historical note that in Alan Turing's 1936 paper, in which he first proposed this model, the inspiration does not seem to come from any thought of an electromechanical device, but rather from the experience of doing computations on paper. In section 9, he starts from the idea of a person, who he calls the computer, working with pen and paper, and then argues that his proposed machine can do what this person does. So here I am, a computer, with my pen and paper, and we'll follow Turing's argument that his machine can do what I can. Let's take an example. He's talking about computable numbers, so I'll compute a very simple number, Alan Turing's age, when he wrote the paper. So we'll take 1936 minus 1912, which is equal to 24. He argues that any calculation like this can be done on a grid. Like a child's arithmetic book, he says. I assume he means something like wide-ruled graph paper. He argues that all the symbols can be made to fit inside one of these squares. Then he argues that the fact that the grid is two-dimensional is just a convenience. So he takes away the paper and says that computation can be done on a tape. As someone who has to carry out the computation, I don't much care for this, but I can still do my job. Then he points out that there are limits to the width of my perception. So if I happen to be reading a very long mathematical paper, the phrase, hence, applying this big theorem number we have, then when I look back, I probably wouldn't be sure at a glance that I had found the right theorem. I would have to check, maybe three or four digits at a time, crossing off the ones I had matched so as not to lose my place. Something like this. So I match the first four, then the next four, and so on, and so forth. Eventually, I will have matched them all and can reread the theorem. Now, since Alan Turing was going for the simplest machine possible, he takes this idea to the extreme and only lets me read one symbol at a time and only move right or left one square on the tape at a time, trusting to the strategy of making marks on the tape, like I did with this theorem here, and my state of mind to accomplish the same things as I would under normal operation with pen and paper. And with those rules, I have become a Turing machine. So that's the inspiration. Not a futuristic vision of the digital age, but probably Alan Turing's own everyday experience of computing with pen and paper.